welcome to the Life Process Program YouTube channel, or if you're tuning in on a podcast app, welcome to the podcast. The Life Process Program is an online coaching program developed by Dr. Stanton Peel at LPP. We help people get past addiction and move on with their lives. You're listening to a weekly segment of our podcast that we call Sundays with Stories. Every Sunday morning, my co-host, Dr. Stanton Peel, and I summarize addiction-related news of the week, but we give these stories a fresh spin. And we focus on the fact that an overwhelming majority of addicted people mature out of their addiction over time, and that most do so without fanfare. We want to shine a light on these people and their stories that are missed due to a media insistence that addiction stories must be tragic. And even success stories must be framed as a person hanging on for dear life, always struggling to keep their demons at bay no matter how much time has passed. To learn more about the psychology of addiction, and common sense strategies for developing greater balance in life, stay tuned for the podcast or visit our website at lifeprocessprogram.com. Once again, I'm Zach Rhodes, and I'm here, as always, with the creator of our Life Process Program, psychologist Dr. Stanton Peel. Stanton, thank you for being with me today. Good to see you. We're going to talk today about something that stems from a New York Times article, but it's a concept that I think about all the time in schools. And also it ties into our work with human beings in general at our life process program. And that's people who are uh, nonverbal, or perhaps they believe that they think differently than others, or maybe others believe they think differently than other people. Uh, Specifically, the idea about the distinction between visual thinkers or visual learners are people who are more verbally intelligent. And... The New York Times article that we're referencing, although now it's been a little while since I read it, is by a woman named Temple Grandin, who works at Colorado State University. And uh, Temple has a PhD in, I think it's agriculture and animal welfare and has something to do with animals and and environmental stuff. And she also is a speaker. Uh, She talks about the topics of autism and education and uh, inclusion in schools and how to how to talk to and rear children and people who have learning differences. And so she, Temple Grandin, is a person diagnosed with autism, and she herself was nonverbal in her formative years of life. And Temple went through school, and she didn't seem to be able to go through the proper channels, you know, getting in line, waiting to be called on, um, basic manners, basic things that people need to do from frame to frame during their day but she obviously had these exceptional skills and um the the part about her visual learning even though she didn't speak until i don't know maybe she was seven eight years old and then even when she did it was a lot of screams or mutters and you know words that sometimes didn't seem coherent she always thought visually and when she says she thought visually it was different than when you say, when like making associations, you know, some people will describe something to you and you kind of make associations and visuals, a, a theater of your imagination. She thought in specific pictures. So for instance, she might drive by the Sears tower. And when someone described a tower to her, she would be thinking exactly the Sears tower and she could draw it for you. She could draw just about every window of the tower. So she would get bogged down on one hand by the fact that she, that when people communicated, and they seemed to be having this way that they were communicating that was different than her. She would just get stuck on this really precise image in her mind. And on the other hand, this was obviously an incredible skill that wound up lending its way to other incredible skills. Um, She got in a fight with kids who were picking on her in school, I think elementary, middle school, throwing stuff at her, making fun of her. And she would get violent because she would get overwhelmed by sensory stimulus. And uh, she wound up getting kicked out of her school because she was, she hit or threw stuff at some of the people making fun of her. And it just happened on repeat again and again, she seemed to always get overwhelmed to the extent that she wasn't learning in school. So she had something going on that was impairing her ability to be a normal kid, have a normal day. But her mom never thought, well, she's so different that she's doomed. Her mom was really interested in, the kind of a person Temple Grandin was and what she maybe needed in order to thrive. She wound up sending her away to a relative's place where she did most of her learning experientially on a farm. 
And while she was working on the farm, Temple Grandin noticed that the she related to the animals because she felt like animals had a sim- uh, first of all they're not judging her, so that was cool. And uh, the animals also had a similar way of sort of experiencing the world. Or at least she seemed to think she could really relate to the way the things that seemed to make them nervous or the the things that they paid attention to or the things that seemed to bring them joy or the ways that they would react to certain sensory stimulus. So she studied and studied these animals and wound up developing this, uh, this way of humanely slaughtering cattle. Even though that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who might be watching this who would say, there's no humane way to do that. It's not humane. Well, to the extent that we have cattle and we eat hamburgers and where our culture thrives in meat, she thought, at least you could make the livestock comfortable. And so she developed that she, that she engineered this way of bringing cows through this system where they they had their sensory diet met. You know, there were some places that they were in water and that felt good. There were a certain way that they could walk. Uh, they were in a line instead of being all pushed into one. And for farmhands, it was made it so much easier because the cows were just walking around gently exactly the way they wanted them to in this circle. It was so much more efficient. And the way the temple was thinking about it, it's actually the way that the cows wanted to be treated. They felt like, ah, you know, no one's throwing all this sensory stuff at me. So she went from that being this farmhand because she's sent away from a normal school to developing all these skills and ideas. And people on the farm were thinking, this person's freaking brilliant. She's making my life so much easier. And she went to a, a kind of boarding school for people who are either exceptional or special, I think she would say at that time, and wound up meeting a teacher who, like her mother, saw that she had exceptional skills in engineering, mathematics, um, certain technical skills. And when she started applying those, and when a teacher and her mother, and then now a series of teachers were able to say, wow, you have so many skills in this area. Why don't you skip ahead a few grades and then really pursue this? Everything seemed to develop around her. Uh, This is a person who (coughs) recoiled at the idea of hugs from human beings, although she needed pressure. Her mom built her this box because she knew that she didn't like the idea of a human touching her. It felt like it shut down her central nervous system. (coughs) But in this box, kind of like the one that Temple created for uh, cattle, she could get the pressure that she, the sensory pressure that she was craving, which is super interesting. Her mother also taught her manners. So she was um, dead set on, look, Temple, I've done, I don't know if this is what she said, but this is her thought process, something like, I'm meeting you where you are. I think you're brilliant. I think that you're going to go somewhere. You have skills that are going to help you in this world, and you're going to develop your life around these skills, and you're going to be okay. But you need to learn some basic skills, too. So when Temple Grandin was able to push forward with the things that she was incredibly skilled at, and academically and you know skip ahead grades even though she was behind in some other ways her mother and others were teaching her basic social skills manners like saying excuse me and thank you um can i just like, interject a yeah couple yeah yeah go ahead more. yeah well i don't want to put pressures on moms but god bless moms you know what i mean a her yeah. mom said well she's got a lot going on and b I'm going to work with her. By the yeah. way, that's very reminiscent of um, the woman who taught the um, the deaf and dumb girl. You know that's that's way that's before your time. Like the, you know like that the Helen Keller. Helen, like Helen Keller. Keller. Yeah. And um, Helen Keller was the teacher, right? Yeah. No. And Helen Keller was girl, the person was the person who was being taught. That was very rude. You know, you can't. Maybe she was taking advantage of her disabilities, or maybe she couldn't um, manifest. You know, she couldn't meet those standards. But she had to learn, you know, to say thank you and be polite. It's amazing. Uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, whatever. It's it was a very similar process to what Helen right. Keller did. Right. And the other thing is, so let's hear it for moms. Let's hear it for farms. Um, 
you know, and for changing scenery, her mother's therapy was sort of like, let's see, you know, we can change her, but there's a limit. Maybe we can change the environment. Right. And that needs to be a concept. People would say, you know, my son or daughter, things aren't working out here in Chicago. Let's send them out to the farm. Right. So let's hear it for farms. And then we're getting back to you. Let's hear it for teachers. You know, a certain number of teachers say, oh, he's an interesting person. Yeah. I mean, they're not doing um, the horn book of ABC, but, you know, obviously they've got a lot of the ball. Let's go in that direction, which is sort of where I think you're going to go. What yeah, and think- look, it, an inside baseball perspective, I don't know what that teacher had to do to get this kid moving in the direction that she ought to be moving. But I know that if you're, and I know it wasn't a public school, but I know that teachers, even when it's not a public school, even if it's a school for, for people who uh, have differences in learning, it's hard for a teacher to stick his or her neck out there and say, look, I know we have this way that we pro, you know, we have this programmatic way of doing things. This person's exceptional. And I think that this goofy way could be a way for her. You, you get chastised for doing it. You know, you get a lot of pushback at the very least. And you have to prove for some reason your worth in saying that, you know, this person deserves it. So the idea that even though uh, Temple Grandin was stunk at algebra, but he said, let's push her ahead three grades in math because she's incredible at geometry. Even in the realm of mathematics, he said, geometry is your thing. You'll learn the algebra once you get learn more about the geometry. I mean, he had this idea that your strengths are going to lead you and guide you. We need to challenge you in your strength areas so that you feel like you're a person who's doing and pursuing something. That, that takes a lot. It's hard for a teacher to actually make that point as common sense as it seems. I know you're going to go here, but that gives that's a whole different slant on learning disabilities. Right. Yeah, so I, I you sent me another article too, and boy, if I were on the ball, we would have done this podcast when you sent me these articles. But there was another article about like what is thought, and so there's a way of talking about someone like Temple Grandin, who you say she is autistic, and she has a learning disability, and she thinks differently. Um, but you sent me an article that kind of shows there's total variation in thought. We 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 say these things that colloquially sound like they make sense. I think in pictures, or I think verbally. But the idea that a person thinks in one way and one way only, uh, I think but trips us up way, sometimes. Those words you just used convey completely different universes. Learning disability, different way of whatever learning. Yeah, isn't, yeah, yeah. Isn't that like the may, a gigantic language difference? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I do think so. So the the idea of disability. I mean, can you call somebody disabled if they're? I don't know how much money she makes, and she probably doesn't. You know, she's not Scrooge McDuck or anything, but she's doing okay. She she has to charge a buck. I, I had to pay to go see her speak, and she talks. She can oh, hardly sure even living, yeah. she can hardly even keep up with all the you know huge lecture halls she gives and sells out anytime she comes around. She sells out her best selling books, um, and she has these PhDs and is a professor in colleges. Uh, people want to consult with her and ask her questions about agriculture or about autism or about. Ch- I mean, do you call that a learning disability anymore? Because I mean, you could say, you could say because she thought differently than a lot of other people may have thought, obviously there's a way that people can kind of communicate where we're like, all right, we're basically on the same page. And she was somewhere else. That, what that's what you're saying. She thought differently or perceived things differently or cared about things differently. But, and you may have called it a, a disability then, I guess, because if it was impairing her life, but can you call her disabled now? Do you ever use the term learning disability in your work? No. So there you go. <laughs> who, no. Who, you don't need it. No, you, no. Right, right. I, I, I at least understand what people... Yeah, right. I work in a school and I work with people who are in special education and that's called learning disability. And so I acknowledge it. I mean, I acknowledge what people are saying. 
when they're saying because of the way this person thinks, acts, cares about things, feels, because it's so different, it does impair their ability to do things the way other people are doing them. That's how I acknowledge learning disability. So fine. But um, and so I guess the distinction I'm trying to make here is that she's she's not disabled. She's abled. She's she is thriving. And but still at the same time, she can she is a great communicator to people who have some of the similar traits that she had growing up or maybe some of the similar uh, social difficulties that she had growing up. And one of the, my favorite things about listening to her lecture or reading her books, she's a little bit neurofocused because she finds it interesting. She said, she, she says, I'm a self-proclaimed geek, but she still acknowledges that really it's all about finding some kind of a balance. She was really grateful to her mother and her teachers and people who recognize her talents who said, push that ahead and then everything will kind of develop around you. But nobody just said that'll happen magically. They watched her develop. And then like her mother said, look, you need to know if you're at a restaurant to put your napkin on your lap, to say thank you to the waiter, to say please in line. Now that you're speaking, uh, you need to know if you're going to be um, going to universities or pitching something. You need to know the dynamics socially. And sorry, but for some reason, you're going to need to care about that. And she didn't need to tell her to care because she cared. But she needed to show her those nuances and explain why people care about them. So, so I, I thought that's interesting. The, the so distinction between you and I have an extra. Oh wait, hold on. Let me let me just let me just say the last part. I know I was rambling on, but the la the the last part there is there is an idea, and I think it's a dichotomy that shouldn't be one. That but we talked about this. Uh, 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 neurotypical movement, the neurodiversity movement, and there's an idea that. Okay, it's just diverse. It's just it's just one part of the spectrum of diversity, the way a person thinks, and just honor everything about it. But there's also a part of that that says, uh, don't be evil and try to teach them things. You know, people who think differently, don't try to teach them things that you care about. The Temple Grandin's saying, no, there really are things that'll help you along in life. You know, you want to know how to how to balance a checkbook. You want to know how to say please and thank you. You you want to know what other people care about. So I think I, I find that interesting about her, the way that she speaks. Well, Sorry, you, go ahead. That's part of your job at school. You're a little bit of a translator. Yeah. You came from, a, it's such a stupid term, neurodiverse background yourself. So yeah. you're very sympathetic to neurodiverse people. We used to use the word different before we had neurodiverse. <laughs> On the other hand, you, you get a paycheck from a school where people sort of have to graduate and hit some benchmarks. So, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Mm. They're sympathetic to the idea that there's some, you know, they can't blow up the school. They can't just wander around the classroom. And there's a couple of benchmarks they have to hit before they graduate. So you're sort of translating between fucking neurodiversity and you know <laughs> getting your diploma you're in that right, realm right 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 but, right well, i mean what I'll, what am i but a liaison and so there is my role my job i think is to get out from being the middleman and let people learn how to communicate their needs that's the thing that i think people need to learn you need to be able to advocate for yourself to the extent that is possible for you to do by the way there's a there's a fifth grade special educator at one of the schools that I, I work. And I went in the other day, they have a, there's a kid in the school who will say, um, every time he sees me, like, almost like it sounds like a DJ, he'll say, Mr. Rhodes. And uh, he's a funny guy. And I, I went in past her office the other day, this kid kind of sets up in her office most of the day while she's getting other work done. She's engaging him too. And uh, he said, Hey, Mr. Rhodes, come on in. I thought, huh? So I went into the office, pulled the door, and there was a string attached to the door. And they had developed what looked like a series of lasers, like uh, you breaking into a bank or something. And when I opened the door, the laser went off, and they had this special educator had an air horn that she was blowing. And they were, you know, it's like I set tripped the wire, tripped the alarm. It's so funny. That sounds so wacky, 
And at the same time, it's, it's a guy that uh, when I watch him develop, he went from no awareness or really care of other people around him. There's him, there's people who have the things he wants, and then there's people who are in his way. That's kind of how he was. And being kooky with him, like this is not, I don't think she would normally set up a trip laser trip wire, but being kooky with him has allowed him the comfort that somebody else is in his is on the same wavelength enough that he can lean on them to advocate for his stuff. universe. Yeah, yeah. So I should say I'm not the only one around. There was a point where I felt like I was the only one who was doing this thing that I'm doing, and I think that uh, more and more educators are are working with people to be their best selves. In a way, your school system has gone, hasn't it, from you as translator to you as, I think this is where we're going, you as, well, here's a different way of approaching students and and mass. Is that a fair, going from the particular to the general? Yeah, but although I think that um, was kind of, this my work in that area reminds me of a lot of your books. That's what Ethan Adelman said about your books. You know, he said the best books are when I, I read something and I, I think I've been thinking that I've been thinking that I just didn't know how to say it. I think that I'm I'm trying to develop a thing that's been on the tip of people's tongues. What like how are we failing? What could we do better? So yeah, that's my work. But the thing I want to ask you, if it's not permission. obvious, you're giving them permission to respect differences and, and some tech tools. Right, right. And an outlook. You, you have the ability to manage a situation without panicking. I mean, people are always reflecting on themselves. So when they go in and somebody's doing something weird, the first thought they have is, huh, what's it say about me? Right. You're saying, well, let's relax and see where this person's going, you know? Right. All right. What's the worst that's going to happen? You know, that school's not going to burn down, I don't think. Even if well, it did. They don't have any <laughs> right, course. right, right. If it's not obvious, um, I- I'll let you take this one. So if it's if people aren't already kind of making the connection, how's this tie into our work at Life Process Program? And we're talking about kids and people with developmental differences. How's it tie into our work with adults who are having? I'm going to throw that back at you, Zach. How do you deal with? So you have a client who comes in, and they're different, and it's hurting them. How, where do you go with that? I'm I'm in the same position. You you tricked me. You threw it back. I'm in the same position no matter where I am in the helping profession. I think. Um, if someone has an issue, and a they're unable to articulate it. I'm helping them do that. Or if B, they've been able to articulate it, but not sure how to map that on to the rest of the world, then I'm back in my position as liaison between the person and the world. And I'm trying to bri- make create a bridge between the person and their the world that they're, they're experiencing. And the first thing you do as a counselor of any addiction or a child is you appreciate them. You look for their strengths. It's a strength-based approach. Right. They, um, oh, look what this kid does. It's remarkable. It's almost like you're not nitpicking. You're looking at what is good and positive and exceptional. And it seems a little bit strange to talk to somebody who's in a school to tell them that. Because when you think that's what schools sort of do, but in an ironic way, the development of neurodiversity is a way of compensating for neuropsychiatry. It's like we're so tuned in to say, oh, look at that kid. He's on the uh, autism spectrum, you know, or look at that kid. He's OCD. Right. And you're, you're not looking at it that way at all. And neither am I. We're, we're looking at, oh, look at that kid. He has some really good insights or a whole different way of approaching things. We had to invent neurodiversity to allow us to compensate from neuropsychiatry. Right. Yeah, right, right. They already the problem with school is that there's a common core throughout the country. So it's like kids are supposed to learn this way, no matter your school's population, no matter how many, what ethnicity, what their background, the way of thinking. And if they don't fit in this way, well, we have specialists for that. Well, if somebody doesn't fit into the 
this way of thinking that we've assumed will work for everybody, which by the way, now we've built in a mechanism that says, yeah, everyone's not going to like this, but they're, they're special and we'll do something else for them. Then they've gone, uh, oftentimes it's not, um, well, let's, how do we fit in? How do we kind of be flexible and make this person fit in? It's, uh, where's the specialist? Which specialist do we call? And then there's just another layer of, of a canned thing <clears throat> that's applied to the student. And if they don't fit in there, then it, it goes to another layer of a, you know, tier three of a canned thing. It's it's um, a, an infinite regress of not understanding students. But you're right. The obvious thing to do would One be... One of the things you do with clients, adult clients, is you help them realize their special vision and purpose. Right. And that's a similar thing in school. In school, you can look at a kid and say, well, this kid has certain strengths. You know, what job is good with that? So you only have to have right. sort of one job. Right. And where where does this kid's strengths match up with a certain way of doing things? Uh, Grandin got a whole field going. But, you know, <laughs> somebody can be like a... a well, how many you? She dropped out of school. There's ten million famous people who dropped out of school. Well, you know, uh, Microsoft guy dropped out of school. Yeah, Bill Gates. Yeah, yeah. And then the other guy, you know, uh, Apple dropped out of school. It's sort of like, oh, you know, I've got a different thing. Let's make $10 billion doing a different right. thing. I got a different thing that's much better. All right. All right. So at the end of all of that, I guess we're just trying to tie in. Temple Grand is an exceptional example of somebody who is at the extreme end of her ability or inability to function in the world at one point. At least she felt and others felt. And now she's sort of at the extreme end of success and balance and all the things that you want. So that's, that's a really interesting example. Uh, that doesn't have to be so grand, you know, in case that all sounds too earnest that I, I met a person, well, I wouldn't say that she's uh, somewhere on, she wouldn't be someone you'd say, oh, that's a different thinker or autistic or something. But I met a student, former student who was a high school student uh, a couple of days ago at Moe's <laughs> and she works there and she's a general manager there. And she's like, that's all she wanted to do all through high school is just get a job and work and make money. And then she had other things she wanted to worry about. And for all the effort that everybody put into her getting into colleges or being a part of schools, that's all she wanted to do. So, you know, it wouldn't have been so wacky if someone said to her during her junior year of high school, you know, you want to go out in the workforce, you're not insane. So if that's, if you want to stay in school, there's some benefit. If you don't, if you really think you want to be part of the workforce, let's, Let's beef up your resume and start getting you some skills so that you can go on the workforce, you know? I knew a guy who um, himself, he was a teacher. And sometime around 11th grade, they called him in and said, you know, your son hasn't been to high school this year. This is in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And the guy was sensitive and empathic. So he said, son, where have you been this school year? And they were right across the bridge from New York. He had been going in to see plays. So the, the uh, fundamental distinction is being proactive in a right. positive direction. Right. But seeing plays in New York, that's a thing. You know, people are in the theater business. And yeah. he ended up being his son. He, the guy had to calm down. His son ended up being Edward Albee's producer, who's a famous playwright. <laughs> Edward Albee needed a guy, a director, to go around the country setting up his performances. That's incredible. And this kid had that job skill uh, thing. And it wasn't like he was going, you know, if your kid's sneaking in New York and shooting up heroin, okay, that's a different set of issues. But if he's saying, well, Dad, I... I really like going to plays. Uh, I really enjoy watching them and then sometimes going backstage. That's an alternative gestalt. Let me just throw one, just to tie everything in the world together. Our good friend, Maya Solovitz's latest column 
to me was fascinating about our psychology is what does being a little bit OCD mean? Right. Um, let me take one step back. Among the terms you and I don't use, I don't. I never even discuss this with you. Is autism spectrum? Autism spectrum is a way of saying, well, autism is one thing. This person obviously is an autistic, but right. we're going to say they're on the spectrum. What the hell does that mean? Right. It means that they're neurodiverse. It's another crazy term for saying, well, you know, they're a little bit different. And what Maya Salovitz is sort of saying, Maya Salovitz is a disease type person who's anti disease. She gets, she covers. And what she's saying is, it's okay to say somebody's a little OCD, but that's a funny way of putting it. It's almost like saying, well, there's somebody that cleans up more than average. That's what right. you're saying. Or right. they're a little more, they like to pile all their pencils, you know, in a pile. And, you know, you might look at that and sort of laugh and say, oh, Jim is super neat. But now the way we express that is, oh, they're OCD. And what Maya Salovitz is saying, boy, that's going a long way for somebody who just piles up their pencils and has a lot of neat pencils. Right. I mean, they're not dysfunctional or flung out of school. Who gives a shit if they pile up their pencils? That's nothing. Right. So what she's sort of saying is, well, I know they're, she's sort of acknowledging there are these diseases, yeah. but then she's acknowledging that sort of everybody's somewhere on the spectrum of everything. And so, I, and and as much as she's saying, who cares if somebody's piling up their pencils if it's not dysfunctional in their lives, we're kind of saying, okay, so if someone's piling up their pencils and it is dysfunctional in their lives, can we can we lean on that tendency of theirs in terms of their interests so that, that we don't focus on the stuff that they're not doing and we focus on what they're interested and motivated in doing, motivated by and, and what they are doing and what they could do with that, you know, their temperamental template or whatever it is. So I guess that's the distinction we and might there's make. Another, there. Well, let me use an example of somebody else I know that you, well, you've never met him. Archie Brodsky is a guy who has one of those little plastic containers that he kept quarters and dimes and nickels in. And nobody else did that. Everybody thought it was peculiar. But we grew up in Philadelphia where you had to have a quarter and a dime to get on the bus. Hmm. And they didn't make change. So at the same time, the people say, oh, look at Archie with his coin, whatever they call that. That's ridiculous. Everybody was dependent on him. You know yeah. what I mean? Hey, Archie. Yeah. You got a quarter. Bum a dime. <laughs> right. Bus. They didn't have, believe it or not, they didn't have automatic, they didn't have credit, they didn't have anything. You had to give them the exact change or you had to walk. So peculiarities have a way of often being strengths. I think we can end it at that. But there's a strength everywhere if you care enough to look for it. And I think Temple Grandin's mother, Temple Grandin's teacher, uh, people look at people bumming change from Archie. <laughs> Any teacher who's worth his or her weight in salt and then, and then know like that program people coming in and not being exactly mainstream. No reason to get upset. We want to go with your strength, and that you we've done whole routines, helping people realize their purpose. Uh, oh, I just read another article in the Times. Oh, it's a famous actress. She's appearing in a, a movie. Um, she was teaching drama and she was having nervous breakdowns and she went to a really good therapist. The therapist said, you know, you don't want to be a teacher. You want to be an actress. Hmm. That's what you like to do. And you're going to keep having these nervous breakdowns until you do what you're best at. All right. We can call it a day on that one, Zach. All right. Thanks to LPP clients. Thanks to everybody watching. Thank you so much, David. Happy Sunday. Bye.